This week, unexpected item in the bagging area, giving VR a good kicking and going up uh, sideways. This month marks the 25th anniversary of the self-checkout. The first one was installed in New York on August the 5th, 1992 in Price Chopper. So what does its inventor, Dr. Howard Schneider, remember of it all? I hadn't gone shopping much, so I went to the supermarket near my house with a stopwatch and I started looking at people checking out and the stopwatch went click, click, click. It was a mechanical one. And, you know, and I said, wow, what a great environment. This is so messy. Good luck with any machine doing it. And I said, this, this would be a great, great, great problem to solve. And then I started building the machine in my, my garage, um, actually spending every cent I had on buying parts and, um, you know, got, got the first machines built. See, I love self-service checkouts, but then I'm a control freak. But I do believe they save you time until they go wrong, at which point they become a right pain in the bagging area. The technology in the machines now is less than it was 25 years ago using 286 computers, using, I was using MS-DOS 3.3. I, I had better technology 25 years ago than what you see now, um, which, which is the reason for a lot of frustrations. Please wait for assistance. Please remove item before continuing. So now people are thinking outside the shopping basket to try and update the self-checkout and reduce the delays further. In Japan, Reggie Robo takes your basket and bags your shopping for you. The system, which was trialled at the beginning of the year, scans the RFID tags on all the items at the same time. Since December, the Amazon Go shop has been undergoing testing in Seattle. Once it's working, shoppers should be able to pick up their items and simply walk out of the store. Swedish cafe company Wheelies is working on a similar idea, although this staffless shop will even come to you. Here at Canary Wharf in London, something less spectacular, but which seems to me more workable and more scalable. Grab and Go has been invented by BarclayCard. The app scans barcodes as you grab items off the shelf and then you just go. Payment is taken from the card that's linked to the app and the receipt is sent to the phone, so you don't have to wait in a checkout queue at all. But with all that grabbing and going, are you thinking what I'm thinking? In the future, if you're scanning things and then just putting it in your bag and walking out and all the doors are open, yeah. I can see more people stealing more stuff. So you could basically very easily pick up some item and you can walk out, but the way you have CCTV, you have a man on the ground who basically monitors and all of that, it works in exactly the same way. So it's no more secure than a self-scan checkout, but I do wonder how many people will just accidentally miss that barcode and leave with a lot of unpaid stuff. Although even here, technology might be able to spot them. Supermarket giant Walmart has filed a patent to incorporate facial recognition, blood pressure and heart rate monitoring into its stores to try and understand customer frustration at checkout. It might improve customer service, but previous trials of the tech have been used to try and spot shoplifters raising a few security concerns along the way. And in fact, just this week, the supermarket announced that it is also trialling a scan-and-go solution, but this one relies on shop assistant approval before you can leave. And in China, which is home to several unmanned stores like Xiao Mai, you actually need your face to get in the front door in the first place. Like Barclay Cards Grab and Go, customers scan items using their phones and they can even heat up their grub in the microwave inside. Speaking of heating things up, a similar Chinese idea, Bingo Box, ran into problems when one of its glass-clad stores began to overheat. Now, as it was unmanned, it wasn't until customers began to complain that the sweltering temperatures were ruining the food inside that the shop was shut down. 
It is now back up and running and everything is cool. So it's not all plain sailing for these souped up shops and it will be a while before we buy our weekly groceries in store without some form of human interaction or intervention. But as our patience wears increasingly thin in this age of grabbing and going, it's no surprise that Bingo Box plans to open 5,000 more stores in the coming year. Premier League football starts again this weekend, which I'm reliably informed is important to some people. Seriously though, fans will be excited to see what their club's new signings have to offer. But how do you know if a new player is going to be right for your team? Well, one company is using virtual reality to identify talent and also help players to recover from injuries. Here's Cat Hawkins. I'm in Manchester, home of great football, to check out a small startup that is joining up with Premier League clubs for an idea that's only eight months in the making. I feel like I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> this VR system helps scouts recruit players by using statistics from virtual gameplay to decide whether or not a player would work for a team. But it separately is also being used to help injured players get back to full fitness, mentally and physically. You've got injured players who will often spend anything from six months to ten months, years out of the game. Um, the scientists, the physios will work with them, um, but we don't know what they're going to do in a situation, what decisions they're going to make. Now they can play games, as well as having the treatment, the movement may well be limited, but they can start to feel a part of the squad. Me Hyper are using a HTC Vive headset with the usual hand controllers attached to shin pads. And the kit is wireless, crucial for football drills. As well as this version, they're also working on one for goalies, which will require an extra pair of sensors. Several Premier League clubs are signing up to use MeHyper's VR system because it promises to bring players back from the bench faster. And the first question they ask, does it feel like a real ball? Do you, do you feel like you're really hitting the ball, it's quite strange. I don't know if it's the sound, like the visuals, but you, it is very immersive, and I know people always use that word for VR, but it does feel as though you are hitting it. But of course you're not, and because you're not, it's important the players don't try too hard and injure themselves even more, especially when they've cost clubs millions of pounds. We had a, an injured player last week who's not allowed to kick a physical ball. He's fit, he could probably run a marathon, but the injury on, he can't do it. He got in this, and it was basically a case of, I feel like I'm kicking a ball. Psychologically, it's massive. So I'm now in the rehab drill, and there's a man to my left who's tracing an S with his foot. Now, I can't do that because my balance on these prosthetics just is not there. Sorry, physios. But I can see how that would be very useful for injured players, but not just injured players, in hospitals. Players will complete a set of exercises and drills which will be scored, and their fitness can then be judged by coaches. Elsewhere in the sports world, American football is embracing VR quickly. Striver is a company out of Stanford University currently working with seven NFL teams to allow players to practice anytime, anywhere, without the same physical tolls. And in the Netherlands, another VR company, Beyond Sports, has a contract with both Arsenal and Stoke City for match analysis and VR training. But back in the UK, a man who won Premier League titles as a player and coach with Manchester United thinks the new technology can really help. I think it benefits both amateur, professional and grassroots. You can put pressure into the situation. I think technology is part of, of sport now, uh, football, possibly have had a reluctance to, to use it, but it's moving in that direction. But the kit Me Hyper are offering is not cheap, with packages starting at £5,000 and increasing to more than £20,000 a month. But the potential benefits of VR to the football clubs that can afford it are intriguing. Coaches want to train and test footballers in the most effective way by recreating the pressure and intensity of performing in a packed stadium. 
So what would the manager with the most Premier League titles under his belt, Sir Alex Ferguson, think about it? Fergie would have been up to it. He would have, yeah, he'd look yeah. at it, yeah. Yeah, I think he would. I think he would. He was open to all that sort of stuff, yeah. to be fair. You know, as long as it made a bit of a difference or... Sometimes it's what people like, you know, players like it. They like that something new, something fresh. Yeah. Top clubs are big businesses and the money in football is only going to increase. And as it does, teams will be looking for any way to improve. As you watch your team this weekend, remember that last minute winner or fingertip save might be the result of some hard hours spent in a virtual world. Yeah! Hello and welcome to the Week in Tech. It was the week that the US military announced it might shoot down civilian drones if they fly near American bases. And the telephone numbers and email addresses of Game of Thrones stars were leaked by hackers demanding a ransom from TV network HBO. FaceApp has pulled a new feature labelled as racist, which allowed users to edit selfies into Caucasian, Asian, Indian or black. And social networking behemoth Facebook is taking on TV and YouTube by revamping its video offering. Labelled Watch, it will include specially commissioned shows, as well as cat videos and clips of people falling over. And Disney's going to pull its content from Netflix after the House of Mouse announced that in 2019 it's launching a rival video streaming service dedicated to family-friendly Disney fare. Don't you worry, pal. You had a good run. There's no word yet if this service will show any Marvel or Lucasfilm content, like Star Wars, which Disney also owns. And finally, the man who made passwords a massive pain now says, much of what I did, I now regret. Bill Burr created the US National Institute of Standards and Technologies guidelines, including things like changing your password every three months and using complicated character combinations. He now thinks this is a waste of time, as people still pick rubbish passwords, which hackers can break. They're just harder for us to actually remember. Weather, particularly in Britain, can be changeable at the best of times. Some rather dramatic change to come over the next 24 hours. I should know, having spent a decade as a weather presenter before joining Click. It's not just about knowing the forecast, though. You also need to be prepared, whatever the weather. And if you're not that organised, well, luckily I found a couple of devices that should be able to help. Sunflower open. This prototype autonomous sunshade can be voice controlled or use artificial intelligence to know what to do when. OK, the main function here is probably pretty obvious and that's to protect you from the sun. But this device aims to be a little bit cleverer than that. Now, as the sun moves throughout the day, the top of the umbrella will also move. The panels on it will be harnessing solar power and also making sure that you get maximum protection wherever the sun is. So some of the other functions in here, well, there's a camera and a microphone providing security when you're out. There's also the ability to be able to play music. Now, if I ask it now through voice recognition, I should be able to do that. Sunflower, play classical. By launch later this year, it's expected to be able to fully connect to the smart home, as well as virtual assistants, Amazon Echo or Google Home. All very well if a price tag of up to £3,000 doesn't bother you. Sorry, hang on, I just need to charge my phone. And for those moments the sun isn't shining, well, you wouldn't want your washing getting wet, would you? So how about a smart clothes peg? Peggy is still at prototype stage, but the finished product aims to be able to track ultra-localised weather using the sensors within the device, as well as pulling data from online forecasts, so you know whether you should be putting your washing out or not. Handy if it works. 
But for keeping yourself dry, well, a few smart umbrellas in all shapes and sizes have emerged over the past few years. As much as this umbrella may look difficult to miss, it is of course quite easy to leave your umbrella at home when it's going to rain or just to leave it anywhere. But this actually connects to your mobile phone so it should stop you from being able to lose it because if you move too far away you'll receive an alert. And if you wake up in the morning and the internet says it's going to rain, well you'll get a reminder on your phone to make sure that you take it out with you. The problem was I did seem to get more alerts than were actually required. If you're taking a trip to the beach this summer though, then hopefully your issue won't be rain, but it could be thirst. So if you've been waiting for a drone delivery service to bring cold drinks to your sun lounger, then you're in luck. Well, at this Estonian resort anyway. The Cleveron drone aims to safely drop off drink orders from two metres above. Not sure I'd opt for something fizzy. The company claims this is the fastest response time ever for commercial drone delivery. So whatever the weather has in store for you this summer, you now know how much better prepared you could be in the future. I seem to be living in a time when all of the tech from my favourite childhood sci-fi films is coming true. We kind of have Back to the Future hoverboards. We do have jetpacks from the James Bond films and robot vacuum cleaners from the Jetsons. And Kate Russell has been to Stuttgart in Germany to uncover the latest storybook tech turned real. The picturesque town of Rottweil, Germany, home to fearsome dogs, chocolate box buildings, and a 246 metre tower housing the tallest observation deck in Germany. But this tower isn't just about great views. Built by elevator company Tussenkrupp, it has 12 lift shafts running inside it. One is used to transport passengers to the top, the others to test the latest in elevator technology. As buildings get taller, life gets more complicated for elevator engineers. Building that's reaching a certain height has a tendency that wind and sun is uh, bringing some certain sway to it, which is actually a big problem for traditional elevators, because if the frequencies of the ropes are equaling the frequencies of the building sway, well, you're getting harmonics and uh, things happen which are not so good. To counteract this sway, Tussenkrupp have installed a mass dampener weighing in at 240 metric tonnes. It can also be programmed to create sway and test how their tech handles different weather conditions. There's also the thorny issue of what happens when things go wrong. The tower houses a 250 metre fall shaft, which is used to drop things from a fantastic height to see how they break. <gasps> Whoa. So it's going to a minus 30 into the ground. That's mad. That makes me feel quite dizzy. The tower is also used to test ideas designed to tackle some of the biggest problems facing high-rise living. Already today, lift take about 40% of the usable space of a building. So if you build higher, you need more lifts and you're ending up with only lifts, which makes more sense. So our inside area is, going, is in the core of the tower. And only a few people really have the chance to see what we have built and what is running there. An elevator without any ropes. So this is something revolutionary. Instead of steel ropes, the cabin is carried by linear motors, the same tech that drives Japan's bullet train at 500 kilometers an hour. As well as eliminating the speed and height restrictions of today's tech, this allows passengers to travel sideways as well as up and down, just like Willy Wonka's fantastical elevator in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Behind the scenes, behind the car, we change this exchanger 90 degrees, get prepared for the horizontal movement while people are entering and leaving. And as soon as the doors close, we can go sideways to the next shaft. Right. And this is the most important thing that we come back to a circulating system. 
So reinventing the pattern nostril. Using this circulating pattern means a lift shaft could hold 10 or more cabins, much more efficient than the single up and down ride today's elevators are limited to. And this will only become more important when we start looking at elevators reaching perhaps a thousand or more meters into the sky. That was Kate and that was amazing. Not that the most impressive innovations always have to be the highest tech, of course. As I've often said, some of the most inspiring innovations are those in the developing world that use pretty low technology to do really important things. Case in point, Dan Simmons heard about a group of people who are using a mobile phone to save lives in Nairobi. I'm on my way to Thika, an hour's drive south of the capital to see one of the first centres in Kenya using phones to diagnose cancer. It's essentially a smartphone with a scope offering 42 times magnification. That allows the camera to be placed a comfortable distance away from the patient. A powerful light comes with the system. Its even brightness is critical to avoid misdiagnosis. Violet, what's the biggest change that you've seen since this was introduced to your clinic? I have a lot of clients because of using the audit mobile and the call is a machine. So people here, they say that they have to go to Boris Medical Clinic Center where they have the machine and somebody has to see what, where she is sick. So after taking the photo, we have to see the patient and the patient, to show the patient and the patient itself, they sick. When they sick, we ask them which position of yours, then we have this. So you show them the picture yeah. and, and you say, you tell me which yeah. one of these you are. Yeah, yeah. So they do their own diagnosis. Yes, they do their diagnosis. <laughs> then they say, it, me, I'm here, <laughs> banana, yellow, all I'm the other side, I'm, mm, I'm negative. And then we compare together. Eh? And we have to have two nurses in our... So they, they're going to do you out of a job, aren't they? If they, if they can do their own diagnosis <laughs> through this machine, yeah. they're not going to need Violet anymore, are they? Yeah. <laughs> Many women don't go for the screening. It's been too expensive, and because of a lack of education, many who do go feel it's a waste of time if they get the all clear. That's why Violet's job is to explain as well as test. I use this mobile data to check your Service. Scans and used to cost used 40 to $50, dollars, over half a week's wages. Eva scanning costs 10 When a patient comes, they view their cervix, you have an opportunity to address them, you have an opportunity to, to you know, talk to them about cervical cancer. So the hurdle that uh, um, was previously there was education in regards to cervical cancer. But right now we've seen an improved um, attitude towards cervical cancer. We've seen increased uh, screening and with the EVA system we are able to screen any woman anywhere. The system isn't cheap. It's sold at $2,000 a unit but it's already seen an 80% increase in the number of women being scanned by this clinic over the past year. If Kenya's new government decides to back the scheme it could become a major weapon against a major killer. That was Dan in Nairobi, and that's it for this week. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to give you the chance to re-watch two of our favourite programmes from the year so far, the two India specials. We'll be travelling across the country to meet the people who are working hard to change lives, save lives, and maybe one day discover new life. I hope you enjoy watching them as much as we enjoyed making them. Don't forget we're on Twitter at BBC Click and on Facebook too. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.